Friends, in a Siena College ranking of U.S. presidents, you might be surprised to see who came in first. It was not Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, or even George Washington. No, the best president in this ranking was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And as many of you know, FDR is known for his New Deal, which created Social Security and reformed the banking system. He also got high marks for party leadership, communication, his handling of the economy, and foreign policy. And who was the worst president in this ranking? Andrew Johnson, who was best known for being impeached for dismissing his Secretary of War, as well as for the terrible strife in his administration after the Civil War. Among his worst qualities, according to this uh, study, were party leadership, communication, relations with Congress, and court appointments. So Franklin D. Roosevelt to Andrew Johnson, from the first to worst. <laughs> but as bad as Andrew Johnson may have been, there were worse leaders around the world, including in our own country. So Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederate States of America, is on that list of being one of the bad leaders. Arthur Matthew Karp writes in the Atlantic Magazine that Davis embraced America's deadliest conflict over the right to own people as property. And at the end of it, he earned the hatred of almost everyone involved. Another leader was Neville Chamberlain, prime minister of the United Kingdom who made concessions to Adolf Hitler, which led to World War II and millions of civilian and military casualties. We could also talk about Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia, who left a reasonably functioning country vulnerable to radical revolutionaries. We could also add to our list Pol Pot, the butcher of Uganda, Idi Amin, and Adolf Hitler himself, all of whom divided people and made them hate one another. This morning, we read about another bad guy. We read about the Apostle Paul, and we saw by mission he was a pretty bad guy. Blasphemer he showed contempt for the things of God by doing many things against the name of Jesus. This was primarily related to his persecution of Christians. It says in Acts that he persecuted Christians all over the Roman Empire and even chased them down in foreign areas to have them thrown into prison. As a man of violence, he actually cast votes against Christians when they were being condemned to death. When Stephen was stoned for giving a strong statement of his Christian faith, Paul approved of their killing him. Soon after, the Bible says that Paul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. And I just want you to picture this scene for a moment and imagine what it must have been like to have been a Christian. Think for a moment of the violence and invasiveness in which, Paul, in which Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, entered house after house to inflict violence upon people simply because they were Christians. Can you picture this? I mean, can you hear the pounding at the door? Can you feel the of the people who were inside the house. The Christians inside maybe ran to a closet to hide or got up on the roof. And as Saul and his henchmen breached the door, there's more shouting as they turn the house upside down. The Christians are found and they are dragged, kicking and screaming from their hiding places, terrified of what's going to happen to them. And Saul shows no mercy. 
No mercy. He orders his men to drag them out of the house and into the middle of the street. And these early Christians were not only mistreated, but it's no doubt that they were thrown into an ox cart and trundled off to prison where their fate would be determined. This Saul, who later became Paul, was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. By his own admission, he was one of the worst. And yet, somebody say, and yet. (laughs) Those are words of hope, my friends. And yet, he received mercy. Did you hear that? He received mercy from God because, he says, I acted ignorantly in unbelief. So despite his horrible actions, and make no mistake, they were horrible actions, the grace of Jesus was extended to him and he was unexpectedly saved from a life of violence and evil. Divine mercy and grace made it possible for the persecutor Saul, the Christian hunter, to become the Apostle Paul and arguably the greatest Christian missionary that the world has ever known. And in fact, it's largely because of Paul's work that non-Jewish people like you and me can even see a possibility of becoming a Christian. So what happened with Paul? He went from worst to first. And you know, this is good news when we're thinking about ourselves. Maybe not so good news when we're thinking about the people that we think are the worst in the world, right? But inevitably, regardless of whether this makes you happy or makes you a little nervous, the question emerges, how is this possible? How can someone who is so bad experience such a revolutionary change in their life and not only be set free from sin, evil, and death, but be kingdom. What exactly is this transformative grace? Well, a simple answer would be, at least for us Wesleyans, is that grace is God's loving kindness and powerful presence that can redeem even the worst of us. And we see fruits of it throughout Christian history. Uh, One of my favorite writers is Philip Yancey, and he tells a story um, that helps us to understand the forgiveness that comes with God's grace. He says, I remember getting stuck in Los Angeles traffic and arriving 58 minutes late at the Hertz rental desk. Has that ever happened to anybody here? You know how expensive that bill gets, right? I walked up in kind of a bad mood. I put the keys down on the counter and said, how much do I owe? The woman says, nothing. You're all clear. Yancey said that he was late. But she smiled and said, yes, but there's a one-hour grace period. And this helped Yancey to understand grace in the following way. Even though you're supposed to pay, You don't have to. Think about Paul. Paul was supposed to pay for being a blasphemer, but he didn't have to. He was supposed to pay for being a persecutor. Have to. (laughs) He was supposed to pay for being a man of violence, but he didn't have to. Instead of calling that account, the grace of Jesus was not just to him a small dose. Our scripture reading says that the grace of Jesus literally overflowed. There was so much of it that it couldn't be contained. It spilled over the edges with faith and love. Paul received mercy and went on to become the number one leader of the first century church. And you know, grace doesn't make sense to a lot of people uh, because sometimes we think about it as letting people off the hook for bad behavior. 
And we think that if we let them off the hook, they're going to continue to do bad. Right? But more often than not, experience tells us that the opposite is true. People who receive mercy and grace are usually so grateful that they turn their lives around and do everything they can to show grace and mercy to others. And so I want to introduce you to a young man named Johannes Neifel. Born in Germany in 1982, he reports having a lousy childhood. His mother suffered from multiple sclerosis while his father was nearly blind. While in elementary school, Johannes' family moved to a new city and his father lost his job. And he says that he was so ashamed of being poor, especially because of the clothes that he had to wear, wear and the way that he was made fun of at school. And in all of this, he felt terribly alone. At the age of 14, he began to drink, often until he was unconscious. He cursed his father as a loser and his mother as a cripple. When his sister ran away from home, the local authorities became aware of the family, and Johannes was put in a psychiatric institute for two months because of bad behavioral problems. He eventually befriended some skinheads, who convinced him that he not only belonged, but that he was somehow better than other people. His sister was eventually put in a foster family, and Johannes was sent to boarding school about 60 miles away from where he lived. But every other weekend, he visited home. And instead of hanging out with his mom and dad, he spent almost all of his time with his neo-Nazi friends, getting drunk and causing trouble downtown. On August the 9th, 1999, Johannes, who was 17 at the time, was drinking with a friend when they started discussing a man named Peter who lived close by. Peter was considered a hippie in town, and he had openly criticized one of Johannes' friends for his radical right-wing views. So they decided to go to his house and teach him a lesson. When they arrived at the man's house, they saw through a window that the television was on, and so they believed that he was home, but when they knocked, no one answered the door. And so Johannes kicked down the door and attacked this man by knocking him to the ground and stomping on him with his heavy boots over and over and over again. After the beating, they destroyed the man's phone and left, and the man later died in the hospital. Johannes as a juvenile, was convict, convicted of assault with deadly consequences and sentenced to five years in juvenile detention. He says that while he was in prison for whatever reason, they didn't explain, that he found it difficult to connect with other neo-Nazis, but instead made friends with inmates who were also immigrants. And his racist worldview began to crumble. In the meantime, he was visited by a group of Christians and was overcome with their charity. He thought to himself, how can they love me? I'm a killer. Eventually, prison life became too much, and once he reached the end of his rope, he turned to God. This was only possible because the Christians who had visited him not only told him that God loved him, but showed him the love of Jesus in their visits, in their embrace, in their kind words, reminding him that no matter how far you've gone down the scale, no one is irredeemable. Up to this point, Johannes said that he blamed all of his problems on others all of his mistakes on others, but for the first time, he accepted full responsibility for his actions, and he says that the guilt came crashing down on top of him. And in that moment, he asked God for forgiveness and decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus welcomed him. He was eventually released from jail and began to speak publicly against neo-Nazis and their violent and racist views. And so instead of spewing hate, he now tells people about Jesus. After joining a church and working with their youth, he decided to become a pastor 
and started his theological studies. Johannes' conversion story is like that from Saul to Paul. And it teaches us that grace does not just set us free. Are you awake, church? Grace elevates us. The best part about grace is that it's central in God's rescue mission of this world, and it is available to all people. No exceptions. Paul said to Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Have you ever felt like that? (laughs) I know I have. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And not just Paul, not just Johannes, but each one of us. Although we are supposed to pay for our sins, we don't have to because of Jesus. Each of us is let off the hook because Jesus came into the world to save us. All we must do is trust in Him and let Him move us from worst to first. And even more amazing is that when we put our faith in Jesus, we discover that we are part of God's plan to save the world. Did you know that? That in all of your circles of influence, as you try to think like Jesus, and speak like Jesus, and act like Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves through us into our relationships and becomes part of God's great rescue mission of this world. Paul discovered this, which is why he said that Jesus chose him precisely because he was the worst. Not in spite of the fact that he was the worst, but that God had purposefully looked at Paul and said, that's the worst one, and I'm going to pick him on purpose. He writes, for that very reason, because I was the worst, for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in Him for eternal life. Paul was not shown mercy because he deserved it, but precisely because he did not deserve it. It came to him as a pure gift, one that was given to him to reveal to the world that Christ loves to save sinners. That's his favorite thing to do. And Paul was grateful for this mercy and grace, and he responded by becoming one of the greatest leaders of the church to Timothy, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He judged me faithful and appointed me to His service. This former blasphemer, persecutor, and man of violence showed his gratitude by turning his life around and serving the same Christians that he had sought to destroy. And the good news this morning, my friends, is that we can experience a similar transformation when we receive the grace of Jesus. And that's the key here. Like, it's given as a gift, but we have to receive it if it's going to change us. Even though we're supposed to pay, we don't have to because God reveals in Jesus that there is forgiveness for our sins. Even though we may feel badly about ourselves, Jesus loves us so much that He wants to save us and then use us in His great rescue mission of this world. And so it doesn't really matter if you feel like the worst friend, the worst husband, the worst wife, the worst parent, the worst child, the worst employee, the worst neighbor, the worst person around. Maybe you are. Maybe you are a violent person. 
or have been in your past. Maybe you're a criminal. Maybe you're an addict. Maybe you're a person with a tumultuous personal life. Maybe you've done shameful things that you just can't get out of your head. Well, I'm here to tell you, my friend, that no matter who you are and what you have done, the grace of our Lord overflows for you with the faith and the love that are in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord wants to move you from the bottom to the top and show you how to live in a way that will reveal Jesus to a watching world. Like the Apostle, you can become an example to those who come to believe in Jesus for eternal life. That's a big shift, isn't it? From the first, I'm sorry, from the worst to the first. But the good news of the Gospel is that it is possible for anyone, somebody say anyone, anyone. for anyone who believes and is willing to receive the mercy, the grace, and the forgiveness of Jesus.